hi everybody welcome to my monday evening facebook live oh there's a bit of feedback i don't quite know why but anyway um and i am here with dr monica agarwal who is a cardiologist and i am so happy you are here with us it's my pleasure thanks so much for having me so what we are going to chat about tonight is we are going to chat about the unbelievably important uh, piece that's often missing and often not talked about is inflammation. And um, so uh, Dr. Agarwal has uh, written a book with Dr. Uh, Jyothi Rao, which is called your, well, it's called Body on Fire. And I have to say, uh, Dr. Um, Agarwal, when I first heard about this, I was just like, because uh, knowing you and knowing your work, uh, which is your work is absolutely extraordinary and and in in from my point of view in in so many ways uh being you know a a plant based cardiologist who basically really focuses on prevention you know as well as you're actually sort of a cardiologist doing on the ground doing everything it's just sort of music to my ears so when I heard you had written this book, I was just like I cannot wait to get a copy of the book and to chat with you. So um, everyone who's watching, this is gonna be, you know, if you've got questions, you can pop questions in, but this is a golden opportunity for you to hear some really vitally important information as it pertains to, you know, disease prevention. So get yourself a copy of the book. It's called Body on Fire, and uh, it's called How Inflammation Triggers Chronic Disease and the Tools We Have to Fight It. It's available right on Amazon and probably all booksellers right now, yeah? You so bet. get it for you, yourself, get it for your friends, and uh, hi Megan, hi Maureen, hi Pam, hi Barbara. So why? Why did you write this book? So um, the name of the book is called Body on Fire because most people don't realize how much inflammation they have in their body. And so that body on fire concept is the concept that your inflammation in your body is actually what's making you sick. So it started out with my journey. So I'm a cardiologist, as you pointed out. So I do a lot of preventative cardiology, preventive cardiology. And I've done that for almost a decade now. And then um, in the last seven or eight years, so seven or eight years ago now, I had my third child and um, I had three children under four at the time. So it was a little bit of a crazy life. I was running a full, I was a full-time doctor. I was running around like a nut, trying to be the perfect mother. I was um, pureeing sweet potatoes, nursing and pumping, um, you know, trying to just sort of, I remember days where I would call my husband and say, I'm leaving now, do not feed the baby, you know, cause I've, and you know, cause I did not want to pump one more time at the hospital. Um, and so it was one of these sort of crazy lives that I was living at the time. And so, um, when I had the baby turned four months old, so now I had a two and a half year old, a four year old and a four month old, um, I, um, started manifesting joint pain and it became this migratory symptom where I went from being an avid runner to then actually being completely immobile, uh, you not even being able to climb the stairs. So uh, I was diagnosed with a debilitating form of rheumatoid arthritis. Um, and I was put on a lot of horrible medications that gave me lots of side effects and, you know, talk a lot about that personal story in um, the first chapter of the book. Um, and um, it was a very dark time for me. And I was put on all these medications, had to stop nursing my kid. Um, one of the hardest things I've ever done is to have to wean nursing within a week uh, because the doctors told me that I was so sick and that I had such a poor prognosis that if I didn't get on medications very quickly, then they just didn't know how I was going to do. So this is one of those classic doctor becomes the patient problems where you start becoming humbled by the fact that your body is not in control. You are dependent on other people to give you medication, tell you that you're going to be okay. I was told that I had an incurable illness and I just needed to get used to it. Uh, I learned a lot about the lack of hope. Um, how people, how doctors have so much control and giving people hope and how my, my rheumatologist gave me none. I learned so much about how to be a doctor and how to be, uh, how to be a patient. Uh, it was amazing. 
So during that process, I wanted, I was looking for alternative therapies and looking for ways to heal my body outside of the medications that were taking my making me lose my hair and making me feel nauseous all the time. And I started looking for other options. And it's that at that time, I started learning about inflammation and the microbiome or the gut biota, and the role and impact of inflammation on your body. And I think that people don't understand how much inflammation can cause chronic illness. And it took me time to learn that and learn how to treat my own body. And I'm proud to say that I've been off medications now for over seven years um, since I changed my lifestyle, changed my diet. And now that's how I practice uh, my cardiology is actually giving people medication when needed, but also treat treating them with lifestyle um, and dietary change. So I wrote the book. This is the long winded story, but I wrote the book because I had so much sadness and anger uh, after I got sick. And I, I, I learned so much from how to heal, how to get better because I got sick. And so it was really to honor my daughter who um, was my third child. And I always sort of thought maybe that's what I got sick because of her, but actually she's the one who made me better. Um, so it's to honor her. God, what a beautiful and very, very powerful story. And I have a question because I know I know very well, I'm very familiar with your approach to nutrition um, as it pertains to, um, to uh, certainly to the heart disease prevention and, 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 and maybe even reversal. It, did that, did your approach to, uh, be, uh, for your, in your cardiology practice and how you um, treated your patients, was that as a result of your recovery and and an Ill, an, an illness or did you do, were you doing that before were you recommending a, a plant based diet before or was this a huge change that you made when you got sick yeah so i think i had always understood that diet is impactful but in as a medical student and as a doctor your training is so limited in terms of nutrition and so i understood that you have to eat healthy to keep a good heart and to be uh, but i didn't fully understand uh, what that really meant. Like, I didn't know beforehand, you know, what exactly needed to change. I was already vegetarian, but I didn't really understand what about healthy food, about healthy um, carbs versus refined carbohydrates. I didn't understand about the role of dairy on the body. I didn't understand um, about processed foods. And I didn't understand the mechanism that seems to be through the gut and how all of those foods without you realizing are triggering so much inflammation. And so that can, that happened sort of through my study and experience getting sick myself. And so I changed everything when I got sick and that is how I got better. And so when I work with my patients, I try to do the same thing, which is work with them on working and not everybody has to change everything. And so, you know, sometimes people panic and are like, oh my God, I can't change my whole life. Well, look, you know, I think it starts with one step and you make one step and you um, move certain things forward and you finally see the changes. And I find that most of the patients that I work with once they start seeing the benefit of feeling better, like when they start feeling better with their changes, they're blown away and they want to make all the changes. It's, it's, I know. it's beautiful. I really agree with you. It's like a sort of snowball effect. And I really see that with my clients that it's, yeah. just, you, it, it's also the changes are so um, holistic or, the, or they're, um, they're, they're pervasive because in a good way, because yeah. one little change here and you're like, oh, wait a minute. And now I've got more energy and now I feel this and now my skin's better. And now, but exactly. Right. Right. Now, um, for those of you who have just joined, I'm talking to Dr. Monica Agarwal, who is a cardiologist. And uh, she's written this book with uh, a co, her, another doctor, uh, a Jyothi Rao. Um, and it is an absolutely wonderful book. So please grab your yourself a copy of the book because we are not even going to be able to dive into as you know we've got such limited time together um but so do not delay get a copy of this book get it for your you know your friends your anybody who you know really anyone who you care about whether they're ill or not because honestly it's going to help you to understand the role that Inflammation plays in disease, but I will say, as I've dug into this, it gives you this understanding, and this is what I really wanted to just to dive into um, straight away, 
is the role of stress in inflammation because that is the first chapter of this book and we tend to think of yeah yeah stress stress whatever we're all stressed whatever but it's it's not a joke i mean this is like the elephant in the room this is a huge huge deal and and, and i love that you right from the get-go there's this there's two kinds of stress that, that, that you've made this, uh, this distinction between, or I believe it is Dr. Sale um, who made that distinction between two kinds of stress. And I love this distinction you make, that there is positive stress and there is negative stress. And positive stress is you stress, or he calls it EU stress, mm -hmm. and then there's negative stress. Can you, I know I'm going to ask you to, to take a whole chapter and to put it into just a few sentences, but can you just explain for my lovely community the, the difference between these and how, how it sure. So I always tell people, so there's, there's so many different facets there um, and the systems are complex for sure. But I think sort of the way I like to think about it is that um, you have two, you have two nervous systems. Let's start there. Um, you have the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. In the paras, the sympathetic nervous system, the job is to be ready. Uh, it's your fight or flight. So you're being chased by a tiger. You're being chased by a robber. Your kid is falling, and you have to run. Your heart rate is no goes up, and your blood pressure goes up, and you are ready to. You're not thinking about going to the bathroom. You're not thinking about eating. You're thinking about going because you've got to move. You're not thinking about pain that is a very healthy response because your body needs to do those things to get away from the tiger or the robber or whatever it is. Those are very healthy, sympathetic, um, endorphin um, rich uh, moments, which you need. You need those in order to get through that event. And so then the recovery after you have an event like that, your body is meant to recover. That's the parasympathetic nervous system, which then is your rest and digest or rest and recharge system where your body says, okay, well, I've got that taken care of. I'm going to slow down my heart rate. I'm going to slow down my blood pressure. I'm going to urinate. I'm going to eat. I'm going to notice all the pain that I'm having and I'm going to allow those areas to recover. So that's a very normal and healthy response. What the problem is, is that over time, most people, they don't have a normal, they don't have a, a stress and then a recovery, a stress and a recovery. Those normal stresses are you stresses. They're normal things that you should be able to handle and you need stress for that. But what happens to most people is that we're constantly in the state of using our sympathetic tone. We're always on. So your phones are ringing, your iPad is blinking, the social media is tinking, everything is going off. We're eating while we're walking. We're, we're just constant. We're sleeping five or six hours. It's, we're constantly on the Zoom calls now with COVID, the Zoom calls, like it's a constant state of stress. And we like our phones, when they go to 7%, we panic and we put them into the charger. But we don't do that to ourselves, right? And we don't, we've forgotten how to give ourselves time to recover. For instance, I used to use it as a badge of honor. I used to say, oh, I only slept four hours. I didn't need that much sleep. You know, like as this is something good, something I should be proud of. But the sad part is, is what happens is, is that over time, your body is under a state of chronic stress. And that becomes that de-stress because what happens is, is that your heart rate's always up. Your blood pressure is always up. You're constantly in this state of high cortisol and your immune system becomes weak in those moments. And that's when people often become inflamed and get sick. And so that's the difference that we definitely, we haven't learned how to recharge our bodies. And unlike our phones, which we're so eager to charge, we haven't, we've forgotten how to charge ourselves. And I think that's the key ultimately that there's this imbalance in most of us between our resources and our demands. And so we have a nice picture in the, in the book because we, uh, we make it in a scale and we show that in the scale, the resources, the demands are things like emotional stress and sun exposure and noise and sedentary lifestyle and, um, and high levels of work stress and poor nutrients in your food. But then there's all these resources that we've forgotten about because most of us are imbalanced to high levels of demand and not enough resources. But there's these resources like the way you eat, if you eat more plant-based or if you drink more healthy food, I mean, 
eat healthy foods and you sleep and you meditate and you calm your mind and you uh, switch off your social media and your distractions, all those things are sort of therapeutic and exercise. Those are ways to heal your body and recover your body, which we've just almost forgotten about. So most of us are imbalanced towards too much demand and not enough resource, too much sympathetic tone and not enough parasympathetic. And it's in those moments of imbalance that inflammation is triggered, which then triggers illness. And one of the things that I want people to understand and your, your listeners to understand is why people, because people often say, well, why is it that some people don't get some things and some people get others? Well, inflammation is a broad problem where your body, I always tell people, it's, your body's mad at you and you get this inflammation. But you also have a genetic predisposition to certain illnesses. Your body is your DNA is your DNA. You can't change what your parents gave you, and nor can I. And so, for I was predestined or pre, I had a D, I had the DNA or the genetic code to have rheumatoid arthritis. But what triggered it to be activated at the time that it was? And why did I get inflammation? Well, I was so irritated and inflamed at the time after three kids, it was not sleeping. I was overdone, overstressed, eating poorly all the time. So in those moments of stress, the inflammation was triggered, which then activated the genes that I have. So that's the thing to, con to sort of remember. And so different people will get different things. And you have to understand that some people will get cancer and some people will get heart disease and heart disease is now being fully under more fully understood that it's an inflammatory inflammatory condition. People get heart attacks because those plaques in your hearts, they rupture and they become because of inflammation, which causes a heart attack. So everybody has different code and different DNA, but whether it's activated or not is activated by that inflammation. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's so, gosh, I could hear you talk forever because you put it in layman's terms and you've put it in these very broad terms if you've just joined by the way i'm talking with dr uh, monica agarwal who is an extraordinary cardiologist plant-based cardiologist this is her new book called body on fire some people have already got their copies now or well, since we've been talking um, uh, monica and you're going to love it get it for everyone you know because it there's so much in and the I, i'll just put a little thing in that the ebook is there and we're just finishing the audiobook um which is nice because uh, people have really pushed for the audiobook, and uh, we just signed to do the cookbook. The, oh, uh, fantastic! So cookbook, audiobook, everything. So go check it out. Go check it out on on Amazon right now. Um, but you know, I love how you talk about stress because it makes me realize when you put it in that very broad context that, and the thing that 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 I teach to, to you know to my clients is that it's um, it's what we're talking about is going so far away from what is natural for the for the human condition to yeah. as you say to have these pockets of it's just going completely against our biology and how what we were built to withstand and i would you agree um uh, that there's no wonder that the thing that I hear over and over and over again is almost epidemic now is autoimmune disease and inflammation related diseases. It's just gone bananas over the last 10 years. And so there's no um, surprise, I would say, that our stress levels um, have slowly, if there was a graph of, of stress levels, and for women, because I see it in women all the time, it, the, it would just, the stress would just be going on a straight upward curve and as you say not helped by all the you know current things of being being at home on you know with covid and everything else and being isolated and whatnot so what i want to um tell all of you at home is that not only does uh dr agarwal and and the the, the other i wish we had her on uh, uh jo jothi uh, rao um but not only do they talk about explain these responses in layman's terms, but also um, a, a plan and solutions are given. So there's all these little tips and they come in fast and furiously right from the beginning of like, hey, think about doing this. These are little changes that you can make. Now, one of the things I wanted to ask you was about sleep. You have a whole chapter on, on sleep. So how, I'm, I mean, you'd have to, everyone would have to get the book to read it, but Obviously, sleep is important. How how many hours sleep should we be getting and why is it so important? I mean, I guess I'm asking the obvious, but from your point of view, why is it so yeah. important? 
Absolutely. So, you know, it's funny because I, this was my weakest area um, to work on. And I, and, you know, Jyoti, who is the co-author is a huge sleep proponent. And she was always pushing me to sleep. She's like, you're always weak in this area. So it always makes me laugh because it's true. I used to truly use it as a badge of cur, you know, badge of honor that I was sleeping four or five hours and I was still doing great, which the irony is of course that I wasn't. Um, and so, yes. Yeah, so the average American or average person adult should be sleeping seven to nine hours per night. Uh, and that's uninterrupted sleep, and which is a little tricky. And as we get older, people often, and I take care of a lot of seniors, say, well, I can't sleep throughout the night. Well, gosh, you know, it's not meant to be a stress. And so we just try to limit, for instance, if people are taking fluid pills, we have them in the morning and we tell people not to drink water at night. So right at, before they go to bed so that they don't wake up at night and really try to get as much uninterrupted sleep as they can. If you have a snoring problem, get that sorted out so that you can um, breathe better at night so you can sleep fully. And so sleep is super restorative. It's anti-inflammatory. It's recovery. Just think about when you don't sleep, you're more prone to infection. You get cold. People say, oh, I was sleepy. I didn't sleep so well. I don't, you know, you eat more. In fact, in fact, when you sleep poorly, your cortisol levels are high and you eat more. Um, and so all these things happen when you don't sleep. So sleep is extremely restorative. People can't lose weight, actually, if they don't sleep, um, which is another thing that some a lot of people come to me about is why I'm trying to lose weight. Well, you, weight loss is very difficult when you're not sleeping and your cortisol levels are high because of it. So seven to nine hours, no, not six hours. And some people will tell me, oh, well, my body does better on six hours, actually. Well, it is true that there is some variation. Some people need a little less or a little bit more. But in general, most people really do need seven to nine hours. And if you're not allowing yourself that time, you're really sort of not doing yourself justice. And so making sort of getting yourself good sleep habits. And I often tell people no electronics one hour before bed. And people are like, wait, what? Yes, no electronics one hour before bed, including music. And it's not that music isn't good if you're singing or humming or doing meditation. Those are great things. Um, but I, I recommend no electronics, no social media at all, one hour before bed. And in what you'll find is that you get on your bed, you massage, you may give yourself some gentle touch, maybe you journal, uh, you do a little bit of breathing. Um, and all of a sudden, you'll have such a beautiful deep sleep. And, you know, I posted on Instagram this week about, um, and on Twitter, about how to do some basic breathing exercises that I do with my kids. I have three children, as you know, as I mentioned, uh, and I do a lot of what we call four, seven, eight breathing. Uh -huh. uh, and I do a lot of that breathing, teaching my kids how to breathe and calm themselves. And I do it myself almost every night and in the daytime. And I was teaching people, it was amazing how people said, thank you so much. I need, I needed ways to relax. And all my patients use that too. Yes, we all need it. We need to learn how to relax. We need to learn how to calm ourselves. And if you do that kind of breathing right before bed, boy, will you have a great sleep. Oh, that's wonderful. Will you describe that, 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 that cycle of breathing so that everybody can try it right now? Oh, sure, sure. So, you know, we could do a one. So if you want to do one right now, I would recommend that everybody um, sit uncrossed legs. Um, it doesn't matter if you're sitting in a chair or sitting on the ground or laying down. Sometimes I do it lying down. And the goal is to inhale for four, to hold it for seven and exhale for eight. Should we do one now? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. So I'm going to count with my fingers. So you're going to know how to when, oop, there we go, to when to do the ch the shift because I won't talk in the middle. So it's four, four in, inhale, seven, four, whoop, seven, four, hold, and then eight for exhale. You can breathe through your mouth or your nose. It doesn't matter. Don't worry about those little details. Some people say, oh, you have to do it through. Mm you know, you do the best you can. And then after every breath, I often, I always give myself an affirmation and we'll use my affirmation for now. And then you guys can use your affirmation when you get one and when you figure out what you guys like. So here we go. Here we're going to eyes close, eyes open. Doesn't matter. Just do what works for you. Here we go. Take a deep breath in. I am good, I am strong, I am loved. I 
I am good, I am strong, I am loved. So typically you would do that at least 10 times and you I can tell already that my heart rate is down and I'm talking a little bit slower and not as frenetically. And I notice that I just feel lighter and I do it at least 10 times with that affirmation in the middle. My children do it with me and uh, everybody feels warm. It's like a warm blanket. And uh, yeah, I encourage you to try to do it twice a day, 10 breaths with that affirmation in the middle, whatever affirmation you choose that makes you feel good. And you will find it's like riding a bike as you build up you'll be able to do it really well and you won't get distracted. But at the beginning, you know, yeah, you might be like, wait, how did she do that again? Wait, 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 let me review that again. Um, But boy, is it, um, is it going to really help you calm yourself? If you do it right before bed, I promise you uh, that you're going to feel better and sleep better. Oh, Oh, what a beautiful gift. Thank you for that beautiful, beautiful gift that you've given us all. Um, And now we have a question. Somebody says, for those of us who suffer from night sweats, continually waking up suggestions, I have special cooling nightgown, dark room, no electronics, lavender oil, blah, 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 night sweats win every night. So that you wake up because I guess she's telling you, saying she wakes up frequently because of the night sweats. Yeah. Yeah, definitely tricky um, if you're waking up, but you know, nothing to panic about. It sounds like you're doing all the right things. I would try the breathing when you wake up at night. Like if you feel yourself uh, and you feel uncomfortable, um, sure, certainly have a towel next to you and dry off, but don't panic and then just try to do the breaths again. Uh, and then you'll fall right back to sleep. And so what you're going to find over time as you sort of calm yourself and not panic about sort of waking up or get agitated and just kind of embrace it and say, okay, I woke up. This is gross. I don't feel, don't kind of even give that kind of judgment to it. Just kind of towel yourself off, take your breaths and and you'll fall back to sleep. And then what will happen over time is, is that it'll happen less and less. I love that. That's so beautiful. You just got, you're after my own heart in saying what I often say to my clients is don't make meaning of it. Because I think if we make meaning of it, then it just becomes this big deal. So you can just maybe even have a different uh, belief there, which is yeah, it's not, not a buying it, not judging it, not yeah, judging yeah. yourself and accepting for what you are. Yeah. And also, it's interesting you said that because when I w- did have a few, I never suffered that badly from, from night sweat, um, not, you know, um, hot flashes. And I think it's because uh, of my diet and whatnot. Um, but when I did, I would breathe. And I could literally feel, I would do pranayama because I've studied yoga for many years. So I would do some pranayama and it would just, it was almost like you. I could control it. It would be like I could, and if there was peaks of stress, it, it's so closely, it must be so closely re- related stress oh, with uh, hot flashes. Um, so, oh, wait, I want you on for so long because we've got so much to talk about. So just, just as a little reminder, if you've just hopped on a little bit late, I'm talking with Dr. Monica Agawal, who is an amazing uh, cardiologist. Um, she has writ- also has been through chronic inflammation. So she has her own personal story to tell, which she tells in the book and writes about um, of a rheumatoid arthritis. And um, so this book is packed full of not only kind of information and advice, but it's also from the heart. It's not like you're, it's not, uh, it's actually empirical. You've actually been through all of this. And in the book, so you, I mean, every chapter, there's a chapter on sleep there's a whole chapter which I love on yoga and there's actual yoga you know exercises and uh, stretches one of you left a comment earlier about exercise there's a whole chapter on exercise which is awesome so there's chapter on exercise there's obviously um lots of um information about diet and nutrients and and everything else so it really is a one is a one-stop shop that that starts with stress and it starts with laying that all out for you and putting it in that really broad powerful context and then digs into these different areas of your life so it's a powerful book it's a beautiful book and i am so happy that you wrote it i've just dug in a little bit but i'm really sort of can't wait to get into more of the details Um, so, and everyone's like, I can't wait to purchase the book. Um, uh, so lots of, lots of good stuff in here, but unfortunately, 
uh, we don't have any more time because, uh, as you can imagine, we need to let uh, Dr. Agarwal get back to her three kids, her busy practice and her life. And I do not want to take any of your precious time away from you so that you can have a beautiful uh, nurturing evening <laughs> this evening. Um, so anything, any last, any last little bits of pieces or nuggets that you would like to say to anybody who is suffering from inflammation right now, um, they're afraid, um, they have maybe suffered like you very, very badly. They're in fear right now and in pain. Any nugget that you want to, to give, aside from, I would say, because uh, you won't say it, I will say it by the book, but anything else that you wanted to leave, leave us with. Sure. So, you know, one of the things that pe gets sometimes overwhelms people is how many things they feel like they have to change. And so I always remind people that change is a step wise process. You have to take the time and you have to honor the process. And you can't change everything in one day, just like you can't get sick. You don't get sick just like that. It's a buildup over time. And so what I often say to myself after my yoga exercise, I often will say, uh, I accept what my body has given me. Thank you. And I will push it further. And so every day I try to honor what I have and what I've done, but then also try to challenge it to get further. And, but every day you're not going to be, you're not going to be a hundred percent and that's okay. And sort of accept who you are and that life is hard and things are hard and illness is hard and change is hard but it's not something you can't do. And so every day you just do a little bit more. Okay. It's not about what you didn't do right the day before. It's about what you're going to do right or better or more of the next day and just honor the process and take your time and try to make the changes and just commit. I think that's the key is make that commitment to change and that you're going to do what needs to be. I always tell my kids, I want to do what needs to be done. And so I never want to be sick as sick as I was. It was a very dark time in my life and I never want to go back. And so if you never want to go back to that place, you never want to get there just to try to say, okay, I'm going to make this effort today to make the change and I'm going to honor the process and I'm going to do a little bit every day and I'm going to set goals and I'm not going to make myself feel bad for things I did not achieve and just focus on the things I'm going to achieve tomorrow. Absolutely. That's beautiful. Focus on the wins. And then just finally, there were lots and lots of questions, which sadly we haven't got time to get to, but there is one question that I did want to ask you, because it is a good one, and it's Maureen, who's a great, great regular in the community. And she said, um, even without arthritis, I think she said, or with arthritis, doesn't everybody have inflammation? And I think that was just, just sure. a, a good question. Yeah, so remember, inflammation isn't a bad thing. In general, if you have it in little bursts, because it's your response, your body's response to a, an infection or to a trauma. So you need to have some level of inflammation so you can activate your immune system so you can fight um, and create a response. So that's a good thing. The problem is, is that many people like myself develop states of chronic inflammation. Another really good example of this is celiac disease. And celiac disease is a, is a, is a condition where you have a genetic allergy to gluten. And so when you take in and a person who has celiac disease takes in some gluten, well, what happens is they develop a little bit of inflammation. But if that person doesn't maybe know or continues to eat wheat or gluten products, they continue to develop what we call a leaky gut, which opens up for hours and hours at a time. Well, if you have a short amount of inflammation, that's a reasonable thing. But with over and over exposure, you get this more, more gut leakage, more changes in your gut flora, and more chronic inflammation, because it's just hours and hours of gut, gut abnormalities and inflammation. And it's in those states of chronic inflammation that we become that we develop illness. And so, so yes, the answer to Maureen's question is yes, everybody gets some level of inflammation. The problem is, is, is it appropriate for that illness and then goes back down or is it chronically elevated? And that's the difference between what gets people sicker over the long term. That's beautiful. What a great answer. Thank you so much for coming to join us. We have so enjoyed you coming on. And I think 
if we may, we'll have you back. Because as I say, that we've got a ton of questions and I'd, I'd rather have little bursts of your time, um, rather like what you're, it, it, you, you and I recommend that everybody does. Just do a little bit here and a little bit there, but we'll have, we'd love to have you back if we can. Just uh, people reach out to me on social media. I do have Instagram and Twitter, Dr. Monica Agarwal or Dr. M Agarwal. Um, so there are ways to reach me through that. And some people uh, find that that's a nice um, cause I like to post crazy things about my life and what's happening on a day-to-day -day basis. And that sometimes can be a source of crazy inspiration. And sometimes it's a source to say, okay, I'm not alone out there. Yeah. Beautiful. So follow Mon Monica Agarwal on, write it down now. So you don't forget on Instagram, on social media, get the book. The audio book is, is the audio, when is the audio book available? They're, they're doing it now. And so we're the, hopefully soon. Soon. So soon. If not, just grab the actual book. I kind of like the book because I like to write notes and underline and put little poster notes in there. But, you know, take your pick. Just get that anyway. And um, yeah. And thank you so, so much. Have a beautiful evening. And thank you for My what pleasure. you do. Thank you, honestly, for what you do, because you're providing you are, you know, you, it, it's so meaningful to me and my community, that you are a doctor, that you are a cardiologist, that you take this approach that is so deeply preventative and soulful, and that even in your busy schedule of being a practicing cardiologist, you've taken the time out to put together um, this book, which I know is no no easy feat, having written a few myself. So um, thank you for your service um, oh, you. and your contribution really honestly to, to, to the world through what you're doing. It's, it's, it's very powerful and we're very grateful for you. <laughs> so have a beautiful, beautiful evening and we'll have you back and good night everybody. And thank you, thank you for joining us. Thanks good so night. much, bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.